Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Visiting Speaker Series. My name is Tamara Pesek. I'm so glad you all were able to make time this afternoon for this fantastic talk by Professor Sri Kumar Rao, uh, who teaches both at Long Island University um, and Columbia University and the London School of Business. Um, and probably a list of other universities here in the very short future. He teaches an incredibly popular course in all of these business schools um, that he has recently written a book based on the contents. Um, it's truly a fascinating process that he takes his students through and I, I won't give any of it away because I'm sure he can explain it much more interestingly than I can. So please help me welcome Dr. Rao. Is it on? Yes. No, all right. Hello, folks. <clears throat> Thank you for coming here on this afternoon, and I'm really glad to be here with you. And uh, considering where we are, I have to announce that I have a gift for you today. And the gift is, I'm not going to be using PowerPoint. <laughs> What I'm going to be talking about today is how you can create your ideal job. And before we're done today, I will have given you a blueprint which will absolutely permit you to begin the task of creating your ideal job. And let me tell you what I mean by your ideal job. I have a thesis, and my thesis is that if you don't get up in the morning absolutely thrilled to be doing what you do, if you don't come alive at the thought of getting to work, if you don't fall in on your knees in involuntary gratitude at the good fortune that's been bestowed on you. You're wasting your life. And life is too short to waste. Think about it, you know, when I graduated from Columbia way back then, uh, if you got a regular job, and a regular job is with a company which made something, those days there were actually companies which made something, <laughs> then you put in uh, four, maybe 45 hours a week. If you join consulting, 60 hours a week. If you join investment banking, 70 hours a week. And if you were a lawyer, then you wanted to bill 1,800 hours a year. <laughs> These days, every job is 60 hours a week. Consulting is 75 and more. Investment banking is 90 or more. And if uh, an attorney bills 2,000 hours, they debate whether to keep him or her or let him go. So when you're putting in that kind of hours, if you're not passionately involved in what you're doing, then I'm suggesting to you that you're living in uh, new age corporate hell. And life is too short to be in there. So what I propose to do today is to tell you how you can be in that glorious situation that I mentioned. And I notice there are a number of people smiling because they're very skeptical because you know that that's not attainable. So here's what I'm going to tell you. <coughs> if you conscientiously and sincerely do what I'm advocating, you will well, if you won't get there, you'll, get, you'll certainly make very large progress. That's the good news. The bad news is that it ain't necessarily going to happen tomorrow. I'm not talking weeks and months. I'm talking years and possibly decades. But the good news is it really doesn't matter. Because once you get started on that, it's a little bit like you want to go to Hawaii on a cruise. And it's going to take you a long time to go to Hawaii, but it doesn't matter because cruise is where, the cruise is where it's at. 
So the journey itself is very pleasant. So <clears throat> uh, once you get started on that, you'll certainly make enough progress fast enough that you'll never want to go back to where you were. OK? So that's my promise. Now, that's the first part of what I want to do. And if we have time, I will touch on another topic. And the other topic is, how do you form very powerful and very close networks? I'm not quite sure if we'll have time to that. But if we do, then that's the other topic that I'm going to, talk, uh, I'm going to address. All right. So before I tell you how you can get started on creating your ideal job, I want to <clears throat> give a little bit of background and introduce three concepts. And concept number one is the concept of mental chatter. And mental chatter is the internal monologue that is going on in your heads at all time. Begins when you get up in the morning, continues right through till you go to bed, and quite often it prevents you from going to sleep. In fact, there is mental chatter going on in your heads right now. And I can actually hear some of it. <laughs> Jay, I got so much work to do. Can I really afford to come to this talk? Is he going to say something useful? Sounds like new age hookum. Maybe I shouldn't have come here after all. I don't like coming to book signings anyway. They always make you buy the book at full price. I can buy it on Amazon at 35% off. <laughs> Will I look cheap if I slip out without buying the book? <laughs> That's mental chatter. You have it going on in your heads right now. It's always with you. And most of the time, you're not even aware of the fact that you have mental chatter going on. Big mistake. <clears throat> and I say it's a big mistake because your mental chatter shapes the world that you live in. It creates the reality that you experience. And I'll say more about that as I go on. <clears throat> the second concept that I want to introduce is a concept called a mental model. And a mental model is a notion you have of this is how the world works. The only thing is, Though you have a mental model, you don't recognize it as a mental model. You think it's reality. That's the way things are. This is how it is. But it's really just a mental model. And you have dozens of mental models, possibly hundreds of mental models. And they <coughs> are uh, different. You've got one model for how do I get ahead in my job? Another model for how do I find a mate? A third model for how do I bring up my children? A fourth model for how do I pick a restaurant to go out for dinner? Whatever. You've got dozens, hundreds. You live your life based upon these mental models. In fact, when I said earlier that I am going to show you how you can find deep meaning in your work, some of you started thinking. And this is a combination of mental chatters and mental models interfering with each other. And your mental model was deep meaning. That doesn't work. You know, deep meaning is if uh, you know, you're working for Mother Teresa or Gandhi or something like that. Me, you know, I write code or I peddle mutual funds or sell soap. There's no deep meaning in this. <clears throat> That's a mental model. We'll examine that in a while. All right. So we've covered mental chatter. We've covered mental model. And the third and equally important concept I want to draw to your attention is something called the me-centered universe. And the me-centered universe is something that all of us live in, including this lady here with the red sweater. <laughs> and the me-centered universe basically means that I am going to interpret everything that happens to me or everything that happens, any event, any place, and I'm going to look at it solely in terms of what's its impact on me. Let me repeat that. Stuff happens, and I'm going to look at it, and I'm going to react to it based upon how does it impact me. <clears throat> You're driving on the highway, 
you hear there's an accident, and you say, gee, you know, how, how, how late am I going to be? Your spouse gets a great job offer, and your first thought is, how is this going to affect our relationship? Your daughter comes home and she's got multiple piercings on uh, various parts of her body and tattoos in inappropriate places. And your thought is, what are my friends going to think about my parenting abilities? That's the me-centered universe. And all of us spend time in the me-centered universe. And what I want to draw to your attention I'm not saying anything is good or bad. I'm simply drawing to your attention that if you spend the vast majority of your time living in a me-centered universe, you are inevitably going to face frustration, anguish, you know, you're going to be very unhappy with your lot. That just comes with the territory. That's the way it is. And I'm going to throw that out for you to consider it. Now, <clears throat> this is a, a nice company to work for. So I know none of you go around saying, oh God, my job sucks. And I don't like Monday mornings. So I know none of you are in that unfortunate situation. <laughs> but if you are in the situation where you sometimes feel less than happy with what you're doing, I'm going to suggest that two things are true. And the two things that are true are, Number one, you are living squarely in a me-centered universe. Oh me, poor me, I'm so bright, so brilliant, so talented, and my boss doesn't recognize me, and I don't get paid enough money, and you know, all these things are wrong with my life, and oh, poor me, how, how sad things are. Think about it. Every time you're deeply unhappy with what you're doing, you're living in a me-centered universe. That's number one. The second thing is you're focusing squarely on the two, three, four, or five things which are not right with your job. And by not right, what I mean is you wish that they were different from what they are. And you're totally ignoring the 50 or 200 things which are right with your job. Think about this. This is true always. Every time you wake up and you're unhappy with your job and you commiserate with yourself on how bad things are, you're living in a me-centered universe and you're concentrating on the two, three, four things which are not going the way you would like and totally ignoring all of the stuff which is right with your job. Anybody care to challenge me on that? It's, it's okay, pipe up? No, all right. <coughs> Now, I can't tell if you're being a bashful audience or if the power of my logic has uh, simply swept you away. So let me, let me assume it's the latter and go forward, because I'm going to give you a suggestion right now. And I'm going to show you how you can fix it. And uh, please understand that uh, I spend most of my time dealing with MBAs in some of the top schools in the world. And MBAs in the top schools in the world are not known for their bashfulness or their ability to accept concepts like this. And it's in that milieu that my course has become one of the highest rated courses. And to my knowledge, it's the only course at any top MBA program that has its own alumni association. <laughs> so, <coughs> I mean, obviously, you know, there's, there's something going on there because they're not doing it because they like me. Now do I pay them. I wish I could, but I can't afford it. All right, so here's what I suggest you do. And do, try this as an experiment. What I'm saying, by the way, is at MBAs uh, in business schools, one of the things that comes through immediately is the moment a professor makes a statement, especially a categorical statement like I make, uh, if I say this, they'll immediately come up with a set of circumstances in which obviously it's not valid and you know, they feel very good about doing that. So <clears throat> that, that comes with the ter territory. So. What I'm going to ask you is, I'm going to make a number of statements, I'm going to present you models, and I'm telling you up front that all of the models I give you are false. If you push hard enough, if you penetrate deep enough, the models I'm going to give you are going to crumple. 
So I'm telling you that up front, so there's no point wasting your time saying it's false, because I'm telling you they're false. So don't ask yourself, is this model true or not? Because I'm telling you, they're not. The question to ask yourself is, does this work for me in my life now better than the model I'm using? The same models which you have not subjected to the same scrutiny because they're equally false. Okay? So what you're going to do is you're not going to say whether it's true. You're not going to try to pin me down on it's false because I'm telling you it's false. What you're going to do is you're going to say, does it work for me in my life better than the model that I'm using now? And if you try it out and it works better for you in your life now, then you're going to accept it, you're going to modify it, you're going to tinker it to your particular situation and work with it. And if not, then you'll simply go on to the next one. Is that fair enough? Right? Okay, so here's what you're going to do. What you're going to do is you're going to spend one week. And in that week, you're going to be carrying something around with you. Your Palm Pilot will do fine. Or, uh, you know, take a sheet of paper. I, I'm basically a paper and pencil man. Keep a notebook like this gentleman here. And what you're going to do for one week is note down everything that is good or feels right about your job. Everything. Why are you still in it? Well, one, one reason could be you're compensated inadequately, I will grant you, but still that uh, <coughs> does enable you to you know, pay the mortgage and look after your family and all the rest of that. And this, this, by the way, is a given. I've never met an MBA candidate who feels that he has been adequately compensated, so I'm <coughs> well aware of how it goes on, okay? So that's, that's something to be grateful for. So poor as it is, it still keeps you off the streets. You might have a toxic boss, but maybe there are colleagues whom you like interacting with, at least some of them. Maybe you like the Saturday evening chess club, or you just like being in Seattle. Maybe the restrooms are really clean and the Coke in the vending machine is always cold. Make a note of it. Make a, make a note of all of the things which are substantive and all of the things which are not so substantive, but all of the things which are really good. If you give some thought to it, I will guarantee you that you will come up very easily with 50, 60, 70, you know, maybe as many as a couple of hundred things which are right. Think about it. And what you're going to do is you're going to spend all of your time thinking of the things which are right about your job. And you're going to start feeling genuinely grateful for them. So what happens basically is you're getting yourself into a different mindset. You're building a different model. And the model you're building is, hey, here are all these things which are really nice and great about my job. Are you play acting? In all likelihood, yes. Yeah? So the latter part of your statement, you will genuinely feel good. Is that your contention or is that your instruction? No. <laughs> what I'm going to say is that you're going to come up with what's genuinely good about your job. And uh, uh, once you've done that, you're going to feel, start feeling better about it. But we've just started, so hold off, because we're, we're going, we haven't stopped. We're going a lot further. This is just the first week, OK? <laughs> Boy, you know, I, I can tell I'm going to have a problem with that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's going to be one for, uh, uh, for alumni of, uh, which school do you go to? Michigan. Oh, all right, fine. <clears throat> okay, so what do you do after that is you're going to set yourself a project, and this project is going to be a one-month project. And actually, you're not going to set yourself a project. You're going to set yourself a series of projects, and each one of those will last for a month. You all clear about that? And here's what you're going to do. For that month, you're going to pick one significant area of the list that you've made and something which you like in your job and something that you'd like to have more about. And you get to pick what it is. For example, you know, most of my customers are Turkey, but there's Turkeys, but there's one I really like interacting with. So your project could be, how do I get more customers like that? Or your project could be, how can I make sure that all of my interactions with customers are like that? You get to choose. 
But what you'll do is something which will increase that portion of your job that you have decided is something that you like and something which also involves significant learning on your part. It's got to get you out of your comfort zone. All right? Let me repeat that. Two things. You're going to pick a project and you're going to decide that. It's got a timeline of one month. It's got to involve significant learning on your part. It's got to push you out of your comfort zone. And it should increase some part of your job that is important to you and that you like. All right? And for the next month, what you're going to do is every single day you're going to do something, preferably first thing, but if you can't manage first thing any time during the day, you're going to do something which will get you closer to increasing that part of your job that you like. You're going to work on your project. And at the end of that month, you're going to take stock. And either you will have reached your goal or you will not have reached your goal. And if you haven't reached your goal, it's perfectly okay to say, well, you know, this is kind of nice, but I feel I need more time for that, so I'm going to give myself another month. Or if you have reached your goal, you say, okay, you know, that's done, now let me do it again with another project. What is not okay is I haven't really reached my goal because I sat in my duff and did nothing. That's not okay. All right, so every day you're going to do that. <clears throat> and if you do that, for six months to a an year. If you do it for a an year, you'll odds are that you'll have completed something like, oh, anywhere from seven to ten projects. And I will guarantee you that your job will have changed beyond belief. And you'll feel a whole lot better about that. Now, once again, <coughs> the audience that I deal with is a rather skeptical audience. And there's a whole bunch of stuff which comes to me all the time. So let me cut off the questions that are probably trembling on the back of your, uh, uh, on your lips, but you might be too polite to ask. So I'll ask him for you. Question number one is, Professor Ra, that sounds all very nice, but uh, I really don't feel good about my company. In fact, one person came up and, you know, he was uh, playing to the audience, said, Professor Ra, uh, my company has just been indicted by the Attorney Generals of six states. So, you know, how, how can I feel good about that? <coughs> only six. Only six, yes. <laughs> that, that particular person said only six. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, the point is, <clears throat> and this is something, by the way, that I always share. If in your job you're called upon to do something which is illegal and violates your personal ethics, then get out immediately. No ifs, ands, or buts about that. Life is simply too short for you to play around in that game. But if that's not the case, but you simply happen to be part of a larger organization which is starred, then you know, you're somewhat different. And in that case, what I invite you to do is think about what we do now is we live in a very complex, highly interrelated world. And whether you like it or not, there is stuff that you do every day which is probably not consonant with your values. Think about that. Do you let the water run when you're brushing your uh, teeth? You're contributing to environmental despoliation. Do you drive an SUV? You're doing the same. There's a ton of stuff. Do you buy you know, particular brands of food products? You're contributing the profits of a cigarette company, which might be using some of that to get children hooked in some third world country. There's a lot of that going on. We live in a very complex, interrelated world. What is important is for you to recognize all of this and what is important is that you live your life so that each day more of what you are doing is consonant with the values that you hold. 
And in many cases, you might not even be clear what your values are. So uh, yeah, in fact, I have an exercise in my book which tells you how you start getting clarity on what exactly it is you stand for before you can go off and actually uh, <coughs> implement this fully. All right? Another question which gets thrown up to me all the time is, that sounds very good, but you know, you're, you're just trying to put a, a, <coughs> a mask on the pig. And what I really want to do is, how can I be passionate about my job? And I, I'm not. You know, you're just trying to make me feel good about something that I'm doing. And you know, maybe it'll work, but that's not it. What I want to do is really be passionate about my work. I tell you, you really should be passionate about your job. <coughs> you have spent your entire life denying your passions. Let me repeat that. You have spent your entire life, certainly your adult life, denying your passions. How many of you are in a position where something comes to mind, oh, so-and-so is doing great work, I should do something about it? And it gives you a very pleasant feeling for anywhere from 30 seconds to five minutes. And you decide to do something about it. And then life encroaches. And next thing you know, you've totally forgotten. Sound familiar? Each time you do something like that, you're killing off that thing inside you which is leading you to this is my unique path in life. And you've been doing that for a long time, so getting back and discovering that is not necessarily a fast process. What you've done to yourself is, have any of you seen King Kong? I don't mean the one that just released, I mean the one that released earlier, the Jessica Lange one. Well, there's a time when they're taking King Kong from the uh, mountain over to New York City, and he's on the big raft, and he's thoroughly, thoroughly trussed up with steel cables. That's you. That's what you've done to yourself by ignoring all of these impulses that come. So here is what I'm going to suggest to you. And by the way, this also works, but you have to conscientiously start doing it for a long time. Every time any kind of I guess I'll just go ahead and do it. There should be a mic at the desk. What's that? At the podium. Oh, speak at the podium? For an audience this side, I really don't need a mic, so I'll go ahead anyway. God. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like speaking at a podium, so. My voice carries, so. You can all hear me, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. Sweet. Yeah? I think it's being recorded, so you'd rather speak into the mic because oh. I think it's, you know, it's available for people who want to see it later. That's a good one, except that I don't think the mic is going on. Well, we got technical. Uh. <laughs> okay. sure. This is forever, and I'll put you on that. Oh. All right. <coughs> you just realized that you made me less spontaneous because you <laughs> fixed me geographically. I, I think this is part of your deliberate plan to sabotage the talk. <laughs> 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 Not a nice thing to do, my friend. <laughs> All right. So, where testing, were we? Testing. Okay, so what I was saying is... <laughs> <laughs> what I was saying is, any time a thought comes to mind, that makes you come alive. And it can be something related, or it can be something outside. You read a, an account of somebody who's doing great things in some field of social enterprise and say, okay, you know, this is something that uh, uh, I would like to be involved in. Write it down in your notebook. And here is the key, key, the real key. Every time something like that, how I'm free again. Every time something like that happens, do something about it immediately. Do something about it first. Acknowledge, recognize, honor these impulses. Because these are the impulses which are leading you to this is what I should be doing in life. First, you'll feel a lot better about yourself doing something like that. And second, you have no idea of how these things actually metamorphose. And what kind of strange connections come up in totally unforeseeable ways to make a big difference in your life. 
And you will find as you start doing it that over time a pattern emerges in your life. And some of this could be outside, by the way. You know, I, I really want to play tennis. I haven't played tennis. Go start playing tennis. Is that likely to be a career? Somewhat doubtful. But it'll certainly add something to your life. But when you start doing that, and especially if you start doing it to your work-related situations, and when you start following up on these things that make you come alive, you will find over time that more and more of it happens. Because one of the things that you have to bear in mind, and this is very important, and once again, it sounds kind of new age hokum, but it really is true. Whatever you truly appreciate in your life and give thanks for, if you allow that to take over emotional space in your head, you will find that it increases in your life. Now this is something a lot of MBA students have a big, a great difficulty in understanding. And I remember in particular there was one student at London Business School who said, Professor Rao, that just doesn't sit right and it doesn't work. So I gave him an alternate model. Once you're really grateful for that and you're thinking about it all the time, that means that when an opportunity comes which you would otherwise have ignored, you're in a better position to understand its ramifications and act on it and that's how, oh yes, thank you. <laughs> That works too. <laughs> so it's entirely your call, you know, which model you want to go, but I'm inviting you to consider that whatever you give thanks to and appreciate will increase in your life. And the way in which you can get that to happen is to start acknowledging these impulses which you have been so extraordinarily good in smothering. So once again, you start off with a, you know, a notebook and a pen. In, in, in fact, I really think you ought to buy stock in some of these stationery companies because I, <laughs> I do, do great things for notebooks. Start noting down all of these impulses, and they're very often fleeting impulses. And even if you're in the middle of something when this fleeting impulse comes and you cannot do anything about it right, right away, at least note it down immediately. And if you start doing that, you'll find that in a relatively short time, you have several pages of those. And then you go back to that and say, OK, you know, this one still has the capacity to have an influence on me over, uh, even though over several weeks. Let me actually take a step to do that. And the more you start taking action on these things, the more you find that they reciprocate. And you do a combination of both of these things, and then you'll be amazed at how your life turns about. Because the model that many of you have, in fact most of us have, is my ideal job is out there. And I define it in terms of a set, sets of parameters. You know, if I have a boss who's more appreciative, if I'm making 50% more or 200% more, take your pick. Uh, if uh, this is what I'm doing from a work structure point of view, this is what I'm doing from an organizational stand standpoint, if all of these things are there, then I'm in my ideal job. Wrong. If by some miracle you could put together all of these things that you have in your head and that is your ideal job and you put in, I will guarantee you that probably in less than six months you'll be as miserable there as you are uh, where you are right now. Because the ideal job doesn't start out there. I'm telling you right now, your ideal job does not exist. You are going to craft it, you're going to create it in bits and pieces, and you're going to put it together somewhat like assembling a jigsaw puzzle. And you have to start recognizing what the component pieces are and start putting them together. And that you can start right now. So if you start on uh, the, the process that I've given you now, I will absolutely guarantee you, you will not recognize where you are in a relatively short time, certainly less than a year. I think I'm going to stop now and open it up for questions. Hostile questions are OK? <laughs> no yeah. relationship. Beg your pardon? The relationship. Yeah. You're going to skip that. I don't really believe we have time to finish that. However, I have an alternate for you. 
There are two things you can do. Number one, I'm going to give a talk at the Chamber of Commerce of Greater Seattle tomorrow morning, so you're welcome to attend that because there I'm going to be talking entirely about networks. Or you can pursue it, Tamara, that you need to have me come back, in which case we will work on that. So those are the two options you have. Yeah? You are suggesting that we focus on things that are good and make them better. I'm trying to think, is that the best return you can get for your effort, or would you rather work also on things that are not going well and make them, because the change there would be dramatic. Um, it's not that things are going well or not well, because there will always be challenges in your life. And in fact, uh, you can get around to the point there are no challenges, only opportunities. What you're looking at is how do you view them? Now, if you view them as, oh, you know, this is something terrible that's happening to me, then uh, uh, you're going to be in a pretty sad place. But you can view them as, here's a great opportunity I have to do stuff, and you'll find that it actually becomes that way. So what I'm advocating is when you're focusing on stuff, start looking at it from the point of view of here's something which is really great about my job. Because if you look back on your own life, there is stuff which happened to you which at that time you were very quick to say, hey, this is bad. That's one of the things we do all the time, by the way. We immediately put a label, such, such and such happened, it's bad, it's terrible. Whereas, I'm suggesting you look at it as such and such happened. Don't stick a label on it saying it's bad because you don't know. And if you look at your own life, there's stuff which happened which you classified as bad. And two years, ten years later, you might say, hey, that was actually quite a good thing that happened. Or at best, hey, no big deal. So why, why label it as bad and you know, get yourself in an emotional downward spiral? So I'm saying recognize immediately that you're in the business of sticking labels on them and those labels are not necessarily a, a good thing for you to do. They take you to a place you don't want to go. Yeah? Uh, first of all, I'm definitely in agreement with your philosophy and I have to say that... Oh, thank you. <laughs> your check will be in the mail. Okay. Uh, just, I know that for myself, some of the worst things that in my life that have happened have actually been huge learning. Mm -hmm. But my question is, um, how does... Uh, a career change or a move fit into this paradigm that you're kind of laying out for us. Because I, I can I can see in my own life, looking back, I, I know for one, one example that I had a job that I just really didn't like, was really frustrated with it and everything, and, and I saw something else that did look better, and I went to it, and in fact it was better, and, mm -hmm. and it turned out really wonderfully for me. Um, but I can also see how, even in like my current position, that if I really do focus on those better things, I can see how it could blossom. Awesome. But I'm just wondering how does that, okay. those big shifts, how do they take <clears throat> It's kind of funny, I've run into that question many times before. In fact, the last time I gave my talk, one of my former students came up and said, Professor Rao, I'm really thoroughly miserable where I am. Are you telling me that I should stick where I am and not search? And the answer is no, that's not, that's not what I'm saying at all. In fact, sometimes the fact that you're really miserable in your job might be a sign from the universe that it's time for you to move on for your growth. What I'm saying is the following. Do not leave any place that you're in from the, oh, this place sucks, I got to get out of it. Leave with gratitude for the place you're in and go to another place because your growth, it is appropriate for your growth now to go to another place. So you're grateful to where you are from and to where you're going as opposed to, boy, this place sucks, I really want to get the hell out of here. Okay? So what happens is this does not just, what I'm telling you does not preclude your saying, okay, maybe there is some other place that I should be looking out for. And in fact, I've got an entire sequence of steps if you're in that kind of a situation for uh, actually making a transition in Kerry. Obviously, I can't go into that now, uh, but that is covered in one of the sections in the book. But I'll be happy to talk about it later if you want to call, email me, or whatever. So the point is, yes, do that, but do it from a position of fullness. That's what I'm saying all the time. Move from fullness. Move with gratitude. Recognize that this place gave me a lot of things which are valuable, and I'm grateful to it, but for my own growth, it's now time to move on, and that's okay. Yeah? So the scope of your thesis is really about work and job. How do you incorporate full work-life balance and 
and the fulfillment that you get out of your personal life and how you balance that against work and really having a, a fulfilling life as a whole. That actually is what my course is about. I just chose to speak about the work-related point because you know you have to kind of take a, a bit of it down here. But uh, uh, if you go to my website, it's www.areyoureadytosucceed.com. There's something like you know more than 15 pages of testimonials, and they only come from two sections of one of the classes I taught. But you'll find a enormous number of people who've talked about everything from how their you know, marriage became better, relationships with their parents and children became better, a whole bunch of them. So variations of this are applicable across the board in virtually every, respect, every aspect of your life. And uh, once again, I can't go into all of that, but some of those are included in the book. I've got to make a plug for my book, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. At the back. What's that? Right. I'm living my life. I experience life through me. Sure. There's no other way I can look at it. Mm -hmm. So how are you? That is a mental model when you say no other way I can look at it. What you really mean to say is I've trained myself to look at it in that fashion. And uh, in my book you actually have something called the other centered universe and it takes some time getting into it but it's a skill. It's no different from learning to ride a bicycle. So you just have to work at it. But most of us, culturally, we live in a world where we are in a me-centered universe. That's what's reinforced all the time. And particularly in a competitive environment, we are also in a I win, you lose type of competitive situation. It doesn't have to be that way. That's only one possible mental model. And it's only true if that's the mental model you adopt. And I'm inviting you not to adopt that as your mental model. I saw. Yeah. When do you see people get stuck in this process? Meaning? Uh, repeat your question. Well, if if people take on this whole process of doing the whole week and then the months and you know, I, I think you know, I think it's fabulous and it probably works for many people. But if if it does, if somebody gets stuck, where where do you see them get stuck? What do you mean? Full, okay. You know, get forth with it. Where do they start letting go of it, or what happens in people when they can't keep it up? Okay. Typically, what happens is, and uh, this is something I have a lot of data on. So, th uh, what I just advocated is one of the things that we do regularly in my course. Uh, in the course, what happens is we got a structure where we meet regularly and we have a, a group of people who are working on the same thing together. So, it's an excellent support mechanism. And therefore, there is a certain amount of enthusiasm we keep going on. Once the course is over, the structure, that particular structure falls apart. So, you know, life encroaches. That's one of the reasons I designed my course so that it has an alumni community which, uh, you know, carries on as a huge, huge, huge source of support. Uh, what I would advocate for you is you're really going on that is it's an excellent idea if you can put together your own group of, say, I'd say four to six people is probably an ideal size. And uh, if you're going to be doing multiple exercises from, from the book, do it at the same time. Meet at least once a month, preferably twice a month, to uh, compare notes. And you know, whenever one is weak, another is strong, so you kind of support each other. That's a very, very good way. Plus, you have a mutual commitment kind of thing. That's probably one of the best ways to make sure that you don't flag. Because there will be times when life encroaches and you go down. So the onus is on you to keep that going. But you can do it. Because what I've discovered is that once you do it for a certain amount of time, you will find that your life has changed to such an extent, there's no way you want to go back to where you were before. So it, it really does. And, and by the way, when uh, I say that your life is going to change, as my course has changed uh, lives of literally hundreds of people and profoundly, Please understand, I'm not being egotistical because I'm telling you up front, none of the ideas and exercises that I'm presenting are mine. They've been all been articulated by persons of West spiritual and other accomplishments who came from different traditions at different times. All I've done is I've taken their teachings, which have been tested through the millennia, and I've kind of put it in language which is acceptable to uh, MBA, JD type people in a post-industrial society. So that's my contribution, if you will. But they're not my ideas. So I can say that they do work, and you know that's just the way it is. Yep. How did you get this course 
started. I'm trying to imagine a business school team looking at this abstract and go, oh, yes, this is business value. <laughs> As so many of my students have said, if ever you need proof that miracles exist, the fact that this course came <laughs> to the level that it did at Columbia and other schools is, is proof that miracles do happen. Uh, I have my own theory, and my own theory is that I'm a marketing professor, and the first time that uh, I put the course up, nobody really read the syllabus. They just looked at a 60-page document and said, okay, you know, sounds okay, let's put it in. And uh, then it, uh, it kind of worked. And so they did it again, and it worked. And th then it really exploded. And it got to the point where it's so popular that uh, uh, you know, they didn't quite know what to do with it. But it's got so much publicity, they figured, OK, you know, let's run with it. So that, that's the closest that I can uh, offer. I honestly don't know. It is a miracle, <laughs> literally. But then that's proof, right? It's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> But if we are, if we are kind of in this me-centered model, if we're kind of accustomed to it, and then we start the practice of writing down whatever a feeling or whatever is passionate to us, do we fall into the trap of getting further into the me-centered model? We're actually talking two different things, because when you're talking about this, you are in the me-centered universe. But you're actually, one of the other exercises in the book, which we haven't talked about, is how you get into another centered universe and you do it in kind of in parallel. And you will find that getting into the other centered universe is a skill. And the more you spend time on that, the more, the better you'll be at it. And here is the key. You will find, if you really want to live a fulfilled life, you will find that you will have to spend much more time being in, not being in a me-centered universe. And in fact, I'm going to say so far that if you really want to have a fulfilled life, get out of your me-centered universe. It's pretty much like Viktor Frankl said. If any of you have read Man's Search for Meaning, if you haven't, I would earnestly recommend you do that. Uh, happiness, like success, is something that you cannot pursue. It has to ensue as the unintended byproduct of dedicating yourself to a cause bigger than yourself. Your challenge is to find that cause which is right for you. And once again, you know, you can do it in steps. And the reason you haven't found it already is because you spend a good part of your adult life basically ignoring it whenever it rears its head. And I'm inviting you to become aware of that and start changing it. Which a couple more questions? Okay, just a couple more, okay. Uh, you said not to label situations as bad. Uh -huh. Does that mean that uh, the pessimistic among us shouldn't label situations as good as well? Uh, you're taking it one step before, and the answer is absolutely yes. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, okay. Repeat the question. The question is, if we shouldn't label a situation as bad, should we take the flip side and also not label it as good? And uh, there's less danger from the perspective that I'm talking about, if you label it as good, especially if you label everything as good. But I'm basically saying, don't stick any labels on it at all. Just say, hey, this is what happened. Because <clears throat> I haven't talked about this, but let me address it very briefly. Every time, do any of you have a toxic person in your life, say a boss or someone, and uh, this person can do things which would leave you a quivering mass of emotional uh, indigestion for uh, weeks or days or whatever? I divorced her. Beg your pardon? I divorced her. Oh, all right, fine. <laughs> <laughs> what you're effectively doing when you let someone do that to you is you're taking over one of the most important things that you have, which is your ability to be happy, peaceful, calm, and giving it to somebody else. Why would you do that? It's a dumb thing to do, but we do it all the time. If someone is your boss, then that person might have some hierarchical control and control over your behavior. But there's no reason for that person to have control over your emotional well-being unless you give it to that person. And I'm saying that there's no reason for you to give your emotional well-being to anybody. Not to bosses, not to spouses, not to parents, not to children. But we do it all the time anyway. 
And I've got a whole bunch of methods by which you can avoid doing that. But the first step always is to recognize that you're doing that. And the, what, the reason we came to that is the flip side of that. Every time you feel good because somebody says, boy, you did a great job, it's the flip side of feeling bad because they say, okay, you did a lousy job. And there's no reason for you to do either one of those. Yep. So to avoid that, do you go back into the me-centered universe? <laughs> this is something that I also run into all the time. Professor Rao, you say I should live... I should live in an other-centered universe because then I feel better about myself, so I'm really being in a me-centered universe when I'm being in the other-centered universe, right? <laughs> and the answer is, yes, you are. <laughs> but you're living, if you will, from a point of view of a higher, more enlightened point of view. But actually, you can go beyond that, and this is merely the first step. Because eventually what happens is you're not living in the other-centered universe to get something or feel better, it's simply a reflection of who you have become. So just as I say, as long as you, there are many exercises in the book, as long as you're doing them and they're exercises, you will get a lot of benefit, but it won't profoundly change your life. It will profoundly change your life when you do them and they are no longer exercises, they've become a part of who you are. Then you will find that your life has changed beyond measure. So the point is you get to that, these are merely stepping stones, but eventually you get to the point where you have the me taken out of the equation altogether because you become a different person. And that's when you'll find it has the greatest impact. Okay, last question. After the first year, what is the next step? Beg your pardon? After the first year. Hmm? Oh, this is something you keep, keep doing it indefinitely. I will guarantee you, and by the way, here's something you've got to understand. Any time you are in a position which is causing you a great deal of distress, and we started off by talking in a work-related situation, so let's stick at it, you will find that there's a lesson in there which you're refusing to learn. And the moment you've learned that lesson, that situation will leave. It will resolve itself in, in a way that you can't even predict in advance. So recognize that every time you're stuck and feeling miserable, there is a lesson that you're refusing to learn. And the moment you learn that, you'll find that the situation is resolved. And in uh, response to that, what happens is you continue. In all likelihood, you'll be in a totally different position by that time, and you simply re repeat that. That's why I say in the syllabus to my course, this is a course which has a beginning but has no end. And uh, you're quite literally expected to remain on that for the rest of your life. And uh, I'm available as a resource indefinitely to my students. In fact, one of the challenges in my life is keeping in touch with all of my students who want to keep in touch with me. That's not a complaint. It's just a statement. So it's a way that I will have to find to cope. But it's a very, very pleasant thing. That's one of the nice things. See, I get to hang out with all of these really wonderful people who keep coming into my life. So that's one of the things that my course has given me. All right, I think we are done for today. Thank you very much for being very patient. <laughs> and Thank you very much. Um, uh, Professor Rao will be around for a little while if you have any further sort of chat with him about. Yeah. And he uh, will also be happy to sign books if you'd like him to come over here.